All right, we will continue our discussion of the blood, looking at the steps of hemostasis, which is the stoppage of bleeding. So we left off last time looking at this um, picture here, looking at the process, the steps of stopping bleeding. So the first thing that happens when you cut yourself is you tear the blood vessel wall and blood starts to leak out. And if you tear the skin, if it's an external cut, then that would leak into the tissues around the blood vessel and would be visible on the skin. But sometimes we can have internal bleeding where we have blood vessels broken inside the body that don't actually bleed onto the skin surface, but there's internal bleeding. And that can be especially dangerous if you're talking about bleeding that occurs within the brain because that can put pressure on the brain and can lead to death. So looking at the steps, the first thing that happens when a blood vessel breaks is the smooth muscle that lines this blood vessel will contract, and we call that a vascular spasm. By having this blood vessel constrict, get smaller through smooth muscle contraction, that's going to slow the flow of blood through that broken vessel, and that would prevent the loss of blood. So this will get become narrow because of smooth muscle um, contraction, calling we call that process vasoconstriction. So that'd be the first step, just to slow the blood loss. Secondly, platelets are going to stick to the broken blood vessel wall and start to form a plug. We call that a platelet plug. So we see that process initiated not only by the breaking of the blood vessel wall, but the um, exposed tissue around it that is releasing factors to promote platelets to stick to that injured site. Then that process continues by a positive feedback cycle. Remember we talked about positive feedback cycle where platelet sticking to the site causes more platelet sticking, which causes more platelet sticking until that plug is sealed. So if this injury was something simple like a paper cut, that would be enough to stop the bleeding. But if it's more significant than that, it's going to take something more to stop that blood loss. And that's the process of coagulation, which means you have to form a clot to stop that blood loss. So a uh, simple paper cut would stop at this um, step, but a more significant cut, like cutting your finger while slicing a tomato, that would require some coagulation and the formation of a clot. So here is a little animation showing um, blood clotting. Sometimes, yeah, that's what I was afraid of, sometimes these um, links are broken and it looks like that one is broken. So we'll just go back to where we were and continue on with the next slide. So here is the broken, here's the blood vessel wall. Here's the little simple squamous epithelial cells that forms the blood vessel, the capillary wall. And then here's collagen fibers that are found outside of that. And then here's the smooth muscle um, around the blood vessel. So when that is broken, when the, when the tissue wall is damaged, the exposed collagen fibers attract platelets to the area. And von Willebrand factor is something that we find in this process of platelet plug formation that causes the platelets to stick. And some people have what's called von Willebrand's disease, which means they don't have sufficient von Willebrand factor to attract platelets during minor injuries. And as a result, they have trouble with excess bleeding with minor cuts. But anyway, so we have von Willebrand factor that helps to cause these platelets to stick to the injured vessel wall. And there's also substances in the blood, which is thromboxane and ADP, which also is um, released by platelets that are sticking to the vessel wall, which encourages more platelets to stick to the site. We also see fibrinogen, which is something that is found in the blood. It's one of our plasma proteins that also promotes platelet stickiness. So I'm not going to ask you to recall all the chemicals responsible for platelet plug formation, but I do want you to know that the collagen, the exposed collagen in the blood vessel wall is what promotes platelets sticking to the site. So the next process then, like I said, if that platelet plug formation is not enough to stop the bleeding and we have a more significant cut, then we need to undergo the processes of coagulation. And the coagulation is broken up into three major steps. The first one is activating an enzyme called prothrombinase. Then that prothrombinase is used to convert prothrombin to thrombin. And then the thrombin serves as an enzyme to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So what we're really looking for in coagulation is this formation of fibrin because this is what forms the clot. 
all this yellow you see here in this diagram, this is fibrin, which forms a mesh with broken blood vessels and forms a clot. So we want this fibrin to be formed to get that clot to stop the bleeding. There's two pathways for clot formation. There's the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway. Looking at the two different pathways, the intrinsic pathway is the pathway that occurs with in the blood vessel. So the blood vessel itself releases factors to start clot formation. Extrinsic pathway is the tissues around the blood vessel on the outside that stimulate clot formation. So we have not only the blood vessel itself, but we also have um, the tissues around the blood vessel that contribute to clot formation. So they release different factors. And notice that in both pathways, either the intrinsic or extrinsic, calcium plays a role in leading to this important factor, which is factor 10. So calcium is important for blood clotting. And recall that we talked about the different roles of calcium so far. We talked about it in terms of keeping our bones hard. We talked about it for nervous system stimulation, also muscle contraction, and here we talked about blood clotting. So we need sufficient calcium levels in our blood to help with this blood clotting formation. So together this intrinsic and extrinsic pathway leads to prothrombin, which acts as an enzyme for prothrom prothrombin 2 to convert to, to thrombin, and then thrombin acts as an enzyme to get fibrinogen to fibrin, and that forms your clot. So the important thing to keep in mind here is that there's several enzymes along the way that are important to clot formation. And we have uh, factors within the blood and factors outside of the blood that contribute to clot formation. For example, we know that if we um, just draw some simple blood out of a, a vein during a routine lab draw, we know that that blood will clot in the glass container because of the intrinsic pathway alone. So some of these uh, processes for clotting can exist by themselves, but they, they work best when both are working together because the intrinsic pathway is a little slower than the extrinsic pathway for clot formation. But we can get clot formation to form either way. So again, fibrinogen is a dissolved protein in the blood needed for clotting, but not until thrombin acts on fibrinogen do we get this insoluble fibrin, which is what we see here, the beige color. So we need thrombin to act as an enzyme to convert this soluble fibrinogen, which is dissolved in our blood, does not you know, form a clot, but once it interacts with thrombin, it's activated by thrombin, and a little bit of calcium here too, we can see that we will end up with fibrin. So again, in this pathway, I'm not going to ask you to know the different Roman numerals for all the factors leading to blood clotting, but I would want you to know that there is an intrinsic and extrinsic pathway where those pathways exist. One is within the vessel, one is with the trauma, or the trauma to the tissue outside the vessel. Both require calcium, and they both end up with the uh, formation of prothrombin. And then thrombin is an enzyme for fibrinogen going to fibrin. So it's pretty well summarized right here, you know, a lot of the, the basic framework for what you would need to know for testing on clotting. So here's an animation of hemostasis. Let's see if this one is going to cooperate. There we go.
final hemostatic mechanism is coagulation. Damaged tissue releases factor 3, which with the aid of calcium ions, will activate factor 7, thus initiating the extrinsic mechanism. Factor 12 from active platelets will activate factor 11, thus initiating the intrinsic mechanism. Both active factor 7 and active factor 11 will promote cascade reactions, eventually activating factor 10. Active factor 10, along with factor 3, factor 5, calcium ions, and platelet thromboplastic factor, PF3, will activate prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator converts prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin initially forms a loose mesh, but then factor 13 causes the formation of covalent crosslinks, which convert fibrin to a dense aggregation of fibers. Platelets and red blood cells become caught in this mesh of fiber, thus the formation of a blood clot. So we can see there's a lot of variables involved in blood clot formation, and individuals that suffer from hemophilia have um, missing factors in their blood that prevents the formation of clots when they bleed. So they could, you know, die from blood loss with just a, a small cut. So very, very um, concerning for those people. So. Eventually, our blood clots do need to be dissolved. They can't remain there forever because once the tissue heals, there's no longer need for a blood clot. So there is another um, set of events that occurs to break down that fibrin. So fibrinolysis, lysis means to break down, so we're breaking down the fibrin, occurs with the help of plasmin. So these enzymes, several different enzymes that you can see shown here, again I'm not going to hold you accountable for those, um, convert plasminogen to plasmin which will break down the fibrin clot and dissolve it. So plasmin is the important enzyme for breaking down clots. Now we also know of other um, chemicals that break down clots, we call them thrombolytics, and streptokinase is a, is a bacterial enzyme from um, streptococcus bacteria that we um, have used to break down clots. We also have TPA, which is tissue plasminogen activator. That is um, something that we use. Um, we carry it actually on the ambulance for paramedics to administer to patients who they think are suffering from uh, a stroke or heart attack. If we can give them a clot buster within the first few hours of symptoms, we can actually reverse the symptoms of stroke, for example, if we can help dissolve that clot. Another important medication we give in the hospital is heparin, and this prevents the formation of new clots. It doesn't break down existing clots, but it does prevent the formation of new clots. So when a person has had surgery, significant surgery, say a hip replacement or a knee replacement, they'll often have injection, injections of heparin that they'll have to give themselves for a few weeks afterward to make sure that they don't develop any clots. Very, very important because anytime we're developing clots within our blood system, the, those clots can get caught in tiny vessels that serve the heart and the brain, and that's what leads to heart attack and stroke. Another uh, vitamin that people should t consider taking as they age is vitamin E. Vitamin E is known as a good anticoagulant, so if a person takes vitamin E just as a, as a general supplement, that is good for you know reducing the risk of heart attack and stroke, and it's a you know, has another, uh, several other benefits, but we're not going to go into details of that here, but it is a good anticoagulant.